Welcome everybody for our presentation. Um, we're giving a presentation about our country, um, Russian Federation. And um, well, we would like to start by asking you, uh, what kind of associations do you have in your mind? First, that first it comes in your mind when you hear the word Russia. Yes? The hymn. The hymn. <laughs> Um, Leon? Cold. Cold. Okay, good. Arian? Bears. I'm sorry? Bears. Bears? Okay. <laughs> good. Uh, Luisa? Snow. Snow. Vodka. Liz? Vodka. Vodka. Good. Good one. <laughs> Jana? Putin. Sorry? Putin. Putin. Well, these are the most popular answers that people can give um, uh, for this question. Um, we would like to present to you uh, two short um, performances. Um, uh, Russian reality. Yep. And uh, yeah, we, we hope you will like it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, do you want to start? Yeah. So, the first one is, uh, so we're going to do an... Um, We're going to do analogies. So we're going to have, let's say, we we'll start with uh, Europe and then Russia, and then we do again Europe and Russia again. So um, performance number one. one: two people, two friends meet in Europe. Life is so shitty here. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> number two. Okay. Um, okay, the next one is smoking break in Europe. In ICD. <laughs> ah, sorry, in Europe, yeah, in ICD. <laughs> And now smoking break in Russia, in one of the offices in company. do you know about Russia? Uh, we um, would like to start uh, with um, three main stereotypes um, that are, um, mo most of the people are um, connecting it with uh, Russian Federation. And the first one is um, 
It is commonly inserted that um, in Russia people don't actually smile. And um, there is actually a very good reason why. I mean, um, <laughs> I'm going to give it, I'm going to explain it. So for a long period of time, uh, a smile was regarded as a sign of um, not very intelligent men and uh, people who didn't smile uh, were regarded as serious and very reliable people. Um, well, actually, we did actually smile. So you can see this is the Yuri Gagarin uh, National Dances, Olympic Games, uh, Nikolai Valuev, the boxer, Uh, the second one, in Russia, it is very, very, very cold. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and um, little people know that there are um, four, uh, nine uh, time zones in Russia, and there are actually four different types of climate. And um, the, ma the major part of Russia lies in the continental one. So the four climate zones are Arctic, subarctic, continental, and monsoon. Uh, for example, I can give you a very good instance. Um, in the Republic of Yakutia, uh, this is the Siberian part of Russia. In Verkhoyansk, in, in Verkhoyansk the average temperature in January can fluctuate from minus 40 to minus 50. But this republic is uh, regarded as less populated one, but it is also regarded as the most, the, the largest one. But people actually do live there. <laughs> I mean. And guys, if you think that's cold, then um, stay away from the village of Olmiyakon in northeastern Siberia, with the lowest recorded temperature of minus 71.2. It's the world's coldest inhabited place. Yeah, but it was quite long ago. It yeah. doesn't. It doesn't happen now. <laughs> and you also like it's reality that may be hard to come to terms with, but it's not always cold in Russia. We do actually have um, great temperatures uh, in summer, which vary between twenty and thirty-five degrees. So, like in Moscow, you can get up to forty degrees plus, uh, plus forty degrees. Yeah, uh, <laughs> plus yeah. Um, and yeah, yeah. This is true. Uh, the continental climate allows. Um, explains it as, uh, since we don't have um, uh, in, uh, enough uh, cl cloudedness, so not, not so many clouds, the earth uh, can get uh, warm very fast and, the, and it can get uh, cold very fast. So we have cold winters, but we also have hot summers. Uh, the third point. Um, in Russia, bears are walking down the streets. This is the popular one. Um, for this, we also uh, have a very good uh, explanation. So on the slide, you can see two main types of bears, the brown one and the white one. And um, the explanation sounds as a bear is an essential character in proverbs and fairy tales and cartoons. And for a long time, um, people were, uh, by hearing this word, they were instantly connecting it with Russia. Uh, for example, when we had an empire, Tsar was uh, actually called as a bear uh, by some um, poor people. And um, yeah, here you can see um, the diverse, um, Pictures from cartoons. This is Winnie Pooh, Russian one. Um, this is called Umka. Uh, many people of my age, um, uh, they remember it from the childhood. And this one you might know, this is the bear of uh, Olympic Games of uh, 1980s. Which were held in Moscow, yeah. Um, 
So, and on this slide, uh, we would like to show you one a very good um, poem by um, Tuchev. Um, I would like to um, read it in Russian, but you can also read it in English. So, умом Россию не понять, аршинам общем не измерить, у нее особенная стать в Россию можно только верить. Uh, many people interpret this poem as um, the people's faith revives Russian nation and culture. And now we would like to proceed with historical points. I would like to give a word to Masha. So I decided not to tell you everything about Russian history. Um, so we're going to just raise four points, uh, or five points, sorry. Um, so I'll start with um, an ancient empire, the cradle of three modern day nations. This was Kiev and Rus, uh, a powerful East Slavic state dominated by the city of Kiev. Shaped in the ninth century, it went on to flourish for the next 300 years. The empire is traditionally seen as the beginning of Russia and the ancestor of Belarus and Ukraine. An interesting fact about um, this place. Back in those ancient times, uh, Russia, uh, it seems, nearly became a Muslim country. The story goes that its ruler at the time, Prince Vladimir, wanted to replace paganism with a new religion. He was tempted by Islam because it allowed men to have several wives. But Vladimir finally decided against it because he thought his people would be unhappy under religion that prohibits wine. So in 900, uh, 988, Kievan Rus converted to Orthodox Christianity. Um, now I would like to tell you a bit about Ivan Grozny, uh, Ivan, the, Ivan the Terrible. Uh, Moscow replaced Kiev as the new center of spiritual and political power, becoming the Grand Duchy of Moscow. Um, in, nine, in 1547, Ivan IV, or the Terrible, crowned himself the first Tsar. He earned his nickname for his ruthless campaigns against the nobility, confiscating their lands and executing or exiling those who displeased him. It was a drive that strengthened Russia's monarchy like never before. Uh, but he started out as a reformer, reorganizing the military, proclaiming a new legal code, and curbing the influence of the clergy. Um, then we have a period of um, troubles, the time of troubles, uh, that last till Imperial Russia. And exhausted by the turmoil, in 1613, the nobles chose Michael uh, Michael Romanov, uh, one of the closest survivors, uh, surviving relatives of the royal family, as Tsar. The Romanov dynasty was to rule Russia for the next 300 years until the 1917 revolution brought the end to the Tsarist state. So under the first uh, generation of Romanovs, uh, when Western Europe went through a political and economic boom, Russia lagged behind until Peter the Great turned the page. Peter became Russia's ruler in 1696 after a fierce power struggle with his elder sister, Sophia. Fascinated by Europe, he spent almost two years touring Western Europe. That was the first time the Russian Tsar ever went abroad. Interestingly, he'd often travel uh, in disguise, even working as a ship carpenter in Holland. Um, after his return to Russia, Peter embarked on an ambitious program to transform Russia into European state. His first target was the traditional looks of his people. Beards were out, Western fashion in. Peter went on to modernize Russia's military and administrative structure, simplifying the alphabet, changing the calendar, and making other sweeping changes. During his reign, Russia finally gained access to the Baltic Sea, defeating the Swedes. And in 1703, Peter started his most dramatic project, a brand new capital to build from scratch on the Gulf of Finland. And over the next nine years, a tremendous human and financial costs in Peter's book sprang up. Peter um, assumed the title of Emper uh, Emperor and Russia officially became the Russian Empire in 1721. Peter the Great remains one of the most controversial figures in Russian history. While some say he made Russia a powerful European player, others believe he his changes were too brutal and costly. But whether Russians speak of cutting a window through to Europe, they refer to Peter's reforms and usually mean a breakthrough of progress. Um, then we have Catherine on the throne. Uh, Catherine II, or Catherine the Great. Uh, born as a German princess and married to Peter's grandson, she became more Russian than the Russians, adopting the language and religion of her new home. Coming to power after her def defeat of her husband in 1762, Catherine went on to become one of the most powerful European monarchs, known as great patron of the arts and literature. Um, okay. 
And a popular expression by Tomkin villages, I'm not sure how common it is um, in England, but I mean in English speaking countries, but in Russia we use it all the time, has also come to us because of Catherine. The phrase Potomkin villages refers to fake settlements set up um, by order of Prince Grigor Grigory Potomkin to fool Catherine during her visit to the Crimea in 1787. After the Crimean military campaign led by Potomkin, Catherine had come to inspect the newly conquered lands accompanied by um, foreign ambassadors. To impress her and her party, Potemkin had elaborated uh, fake settlements constructed along the desolated banks of the river with flocks of sheep driven every night to the next stop uh, along the road to make it look uh, so that Catherine uh, saw lively, colourful villages in reality nothing more than theatrical sets. Um, then we go through the P Napoleonic War and uh, noble revolts of freedom. Um, and then we come to Second World War. Uh, the outbreak of the Second World War found uh, the Soviet Union unprepared for the conflict ahead. Political purges um, had stripped the army of many uh, of its experienced leaders, while industrial production uh, was slow in attempting to military needs. Um, Sorry. Um, having signed a non-aggression pact with Germany in 1939, Hitler's invasion, uh, invasion on June 1941 caught the USSR by surprise. Uh, by the end of the year, the Germans had seized most of the Soviet Union's western territory and surrounded Leningrad. Um, and the number of Soviet deaths was at first um, grossly distorted at, by the end of the war. The figure Stalin gave in 1946 was 7 million, but the USSR's losses are now estimated about 26.6 million, uh, accounting for half of all um, World War II casual casualties. Um, the memory of the war, uh, referred to as the Great Patriotic War, is particularly venerated in Russia. Uh, in the USSR and in Russia now, the end of war uh, was considered to be May the 9th, 1945, when the German surrender took effect, and the date has now become a national holiday, Victory Day, and um, it's commemorated in a grand military parade on Red Square every year. Okay, I would now like to let Nastya talk to us about politics. Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So and now I'd like to outline briefly the political situation in Russia, but I want to start firstly uh, from the very beginning, like the, um, from the post-Soviet Russia. So the um, collapse of the USSR happened at the end of 1991, as we all know. And then the newly new state, again, new Russian Federation was born. And uh, it took uh, for the government two years to adapt, to develop and to adapt new constitution uh, because of the um, mess which was in uh, every branch of life, I mean in political, economic and social life, and um, it took uh, um, politicians two years to get together, to discuss it and to adapt it. So, and according to constitution, uh, the Russian Federation is a democratic federal rule of law state with a republic form of government. And um, so, the breakup of the Soviet Union was a very hard time of uh, as I have already said, of uh, the mass and devastation in the all uh, former Soviet republics. So, and it was uh, accompanied by the um, Chechen war, for example. Ch uh, Chechnya is the region on the uh, east, uh, western, uh, southwestern part of Russia, uh, the region that uh, drives for independence and for its own rights and so on. And this, in this time there, were, there was an increase in ethnical conflicts on the whole territory of the country. Uh, we had uh, huge economic problems, uh, hyperinflation, commodity shortage. Uh, this meant that people had yeah, uh, people didn't have like the basic uh, consumer products, and if you need to buy something, people had uh, these ration stamps. Uh, these uh, were like special cards. Uh, government gave these cards to the people. They took these cards and go to the shop. They were standing like several hours in a queue to buy 
sausages, for example, or sugar or something else. Uh, uh, as for another economic um, processes, the government uh, launched a privatization uh, to, cov to cover uh, national debt of the country, but unfortunately it uh, was not successful and in 1998 the default was claimed in the country and this resulted in mass protests and demonstrations. And um, I put the last one, terroristic attacks, it was not the result of the economic troubles of the country, it was the result of the two first points. And maybe you heard, maybe know, that at the end of 1990s and the, in the beginning of 2000, there were several um, my, uh, big terroristic attacks in um, several Russian cities that was also uh, painful <laughs> and yeah. And uh, next point I would like to draw your attention to like funny fact I think that this uh, difficult time gave birth to the special uh, layer of society in Russia. These are um, uh, so-called new Russians. Uh, yeah, there you can see the guy in the crimson jacket and on, with the golden chain and with the security guy on the right. And uh, uh, do you know, by the way, who are new Russians and why do people call them this way? Maybe you have ever heard? No. Okay, so the point is that as uh, there was no jobs available in 1990s, the people started to earn money as they could. So uh, a lot of them started um, their new businesses and uh, sometimes uh, this business was not legal. So um, nobody knows how they earned their money, but anyway. And uh, since that time, uh, businessmen and business people in Russia are considered as gangsters or uh, those businessmen, you Russians, who uh, got into politics, they are considered as criminals and a lot of uh, elderly people um, don't trust. If you come, I don't know, to an old lady and say, oh, hello, I'm a businessman, I want to open like a new, 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 new school, for example, here, and I want to invest money, blah, blah, blah. The, uh, these elderly people will not trust these guys because they are sure that all businessmen in this world are criminals. So this, uh, we by ourselves create these stereotypes. So what else? Mm, I have a question to you, who was the first and the last president of the Soviet Union? Good job, yeah, he was the first president because before... It was Lenin. Sorry? Lenin. Lenin? Lenin? The first. first. Yeah, because the, b b uh, before Gorbachev uh, in the Soviet Union there were general secretaries, but not presidents. And Gorbachev was the first president and the last president, unfortunately. So, and the first president of Russia was, maybe you also know, because you are good at Russian history. Yeah, you're right. And you can see him on the picture. Yeah, these are three presidents of Russia. So the first one is Yeltsin. He um, took, uh, as far as I remember, he 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 is the president since nine, he was the president since 1991. Then he was re-elected in 1996, and unfortunately in 1999, because of the problems with health, he resigned, and uh, he was replaced by Putin. And Putin. Um, hold this position for one year or something and then in 2000 he was officially elected and after this he um, uh, held his position for two terms so he was president until 2008 as far as I remember and 
Then uh, his um, colleague, Medvedev, took uh, this president uh, post. And uh, then, as you know, the line between Medvedev and Putin was, uh, is blurred because sometimes people in Russia confuse uh, who is the president now, Putin or Medvedev, because they change their position. He is one, of the, one is the president, another is prime minister. So sometimes even I forget who is this and we... <laughs> Yeah, you see, I think this picture explains everything. <clears throat> and who is the president now? Putin. <laughs> yeah, I think Putin, yeah, you're right. So, what about uh, political parties in Russia? Have you heard about political parties in Russia, except Communist Party? Yes? Wow, yeah, good job. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will talk about it a bit later. Yeah, so in Russia there is a multi-party system and uh, ideological diversity is welcomed. So um, dominant party is Yedina Russia or United Russia, and the leader of this party and uh, the person who found this, who founded this party is Putin, and uh, it was uh, established in two thousand. Three and uh, unfortunately, until 2012 in Russia, uh, on, uh, only seven parties were officially registered, and because it was very difficult to set up this party, uh, to I don't know, to get permission or something, there uh, there there was a lot of bureaucracy and so on. And uh, in 2011, or maybe you have heard about protests. Uh, of opposition in Russia that were, a lot of them were in Moscow. So after this protest, uh, there was a liberal, liberalization of legislation and in 2012, they uh, around, okay, now for sure, the Ministry of Justice uh, informs that there, uh, there are 74 parties now in Russia, but anyway, uh, the, um, uh, do, uh, there are four dominant parties in parliament now. As I have just said, it, it is Yedina Russia or United Russia by Putin or Medvedev. Ah, now the leader of the party is Medvedev, by the way. And sorry, I, yeah. And the, uh, they promote the following ideas. And uh, the next party is. Communistическая партия России or Communist Party and this is their logo and this is their leader, Zyuganov. So we also have uh, the party Справедливая Россия, um, Fair Russia, I guess. Uh, it's, yeah, and their leader Mironov and he uh, supports the ideas of social democracy and democratic socialism. And uh, maybe you, maybe Tim mentioned this party. This is Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, which is Liberal Democratic Party of Russia. By the way, this is the oldest party in Russia because it was founded in 1992. And this is um, Vladimir Zhirinovsky. Uh, the leader of this party, who is very um, emotional guy, and you can find probably in YouTube his speeches. Even if you don't understand Russian, you will see his gestures and uh, mimics, and you will be able to understand everything. I'm sure. So uh, this is just to show you that in Russia we have a diversity, at least some kind of diversity in politics. Uh, uh, I have mentioned before that now there are 74 parties registered and among them there are um, the following parties such as the party against all, Labour Party, uh, civil platform and so on. Unfortunately, this was the first time I uh, 
I have heard about this party, I, uh, yeah. And actually I'm proud of this that we had. So many. Uh, what else I want to mention is the, just to show you that um, the results of the uh, pres president elections that were in 2012 because um, some foreigners uh, cast doubts on, um, uh, on uh, support on the fact that Russians really support Putin. But actually you can see that 63% of the people who came to elections, they voted for him. And the second uh, place belongs to Gennady Zyuganov, which is uh, the leader of Communist Party. So um, I, can, I cannot say for sure, but the majority of the uh, older generation the people who were born and uh, lived for a long time in the Soviet Union, they still vote for the Communist Party because they got used to it. But not all of them for sure, and there are a lot of um, pensioners and just our grandmothers, grandfathers that support Putin and his party and his ideas and so on. And another question that is uh, usually asked by foreigners is, um, Actually, to tell the truth, I don't like this question because it's very strange. Like, do you like Putin or not? And what do you think about Putin? It's difficult to answer because it's very subjective and probably we should uh, read the works of the politologist or another specialist who are good at this topic. But I just want to outline briefly why uh, people support Putin. So, because firstly, as I um, explained to you before, in 1990s, it was, the situation in the country was terrible. So in comparison to the 1990s, now people live much better. So that's the reason. Uh, another reason is that there is no better alternative because there is no real opposition in the country and uh, he and his party is uh, the only who uh, do something and uh, real changes can be seen. And uh, some of the people also um, uh, pay attention to the point that uh, since he came to the uh, government, the, the re there is um, not significant but anyway rise in um, household incomes. And the Mm, disadvantages, sorry. Okay, uh, so, and uh, the problems that are linked to, the, to his, uh, to Putin, sorry, is that uh, the, uh, the increase in bureaucracy is noticed. There is uh, the gap between rich and poor has um, increased. Nepotism is that uh, the, uh, I mean here that a friend of my friend of my friend of my friend works in my company, or like a father of my friend of my sister, and so on. Like Putin and Medvedev and Yeltsin, they all were colleagues somewhere, and they all came to the power, and one helped another to um, come to the government. So we can, um, I can finish with the, um, Mm -mm. We can skip this. Thank you. Uh, just a few words about civil society in Russia. Uh, it is, uh, the question mark is here because it is still being formed uh, because it's difficult to say is a civil society in Russia or not, but uh, as only 20 years passed after the uh, break up of the Soviet Union and it's extremely difficult for 20 years uh, make so many reforms and come to democracy and capitalism and so on. And another point that I want to mention is that um, in Russia there are a lot of people who are irrelevant to all this, the things that are happening in the country. They are, I don't, 
I don't know, just indifference and uh, belief that it is impossible to change anything. And there is, the first point is very important because apathy and distrust in governmental institution, uh, in politics and in politicians. And people think that oh, we, we are not going to do anything because it is impossible to change anything. So uh, I think that's the end of my part. And now uh, Alona is going to tell you about the the relations between Russia and Ukraine. I will, hey, hello. Uh, I will try to be uh, not so long because we run out of time. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about Russia's like uh, foreign policy uh, in which I think Ukraine takes like a huge part, at least historically it is like this. So yeah, um, um, if we're talking about history of uh, Ukrainian-Russian relations, we can go uh, back like 500 years, beginning with Kiev truce, uh, the, when every, every, uh, like all three uh, nations, like Belarus and Russian and Ukrainians were started. Uh, but it is like too far, then there was Moscow uh, Kingdom, and actually the countries um, after the Mongol invasion in uh, 13th century, uh, the countries were developed differently, and they were have different languages and um, uh, different approaches and history. Uh, but the thing is that um, every time during the history between these two countries, uh, Ukraine... Uh, there was a lot of disputes and uh, uh, for example in 18th century uh, when there was a king like um, Catherine II um, she actually invaded and she took a deal with Cossacks who Cossacks like it's a, it was a Ukrainian army uh, and uh, yeah so they were in charge of Russian states in those times but uh, all in all uh, the close relations began uh, when, in uh, 1922, Soviet Union uh, was created and uh, Ukraine was a part of it, like uh, one of the republics. And um, so it was actually not an independent state anymore. Uh, but in August, as you know, 1999, uh, Soviet Union split up. And um, after this, uh, we have like Ukraine was kind of in the middle and uh, there was a necessity to choose where to go next. Uh, Valeria? Yeah. Uh, where to go next, to the east or to the west or to the east. And, um, and these disputes we have till now. Um, so I would like to just to mention a bullet points of kind of disputable questions that we have now uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so yeah, it's just like a caricature from The Economist. So uh, yeah. So uh, one of them is that uh, after Soviet Union uh, collapsed, uh, still there are some, uh, so in Soviet Union, all the economics, uh, everything was connected all the scientists, all the industry. Uh, after the collapse, there was kind of shock um, to, to create the economy by themselves and to do everything by their own. And of course, to have a national and own army. Uh, but uh, even still then, uh, the part of Russian uh, Navy uh, like forces is still in one of our cities, Sevastopol, it's in Crimea. Crimea is a penin peninsula in the south of Ukraine. Uh, it was presented uh, from Russia, uh, from Soviet Union to Ukraine as a present in 1954. Uh, uh, so it was even uh, in Soviet Union part of Ukrainian Republic. And after the collapse of Soviet Union, it was still like a part of Ukraine, there was some dispute should it be still there or should it go to Russia? But still, most of people said that, yes, we willing to um, be uh, here in Ukraine. So that's why we have like Crimea, like Peninsula. Uh, but still, in Sevastopol, there are some forces. And uh, uh, this is kind of very strange. The sovereign country has uh, foreign forces on their uh, territory, but 
Th this is how it goes. Uh, then, of course, we have gas dispute. Uh, because uh, Ukrainian economy is really um, dependent on Russian energy forces, uh, every time we have some disputes, every time we have some deals concerning the price uh, for the gas, and uh, Russia have, uh, has different poli uh, policy, gas policy, uh, like for example for European countries it has one price and his, uh, it has another price for, uh, uh, for countries uh, like, uh, which are the part of uh, custom union, uh, not custom union but uh, isn't that? In the Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, which is uh, it's like it's Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, I think Armenia, and other yeah, and other former uh, uh, former Soviet republics. Um, so these disputes, uh, every time when there are some kind of uh, problems, uh, Russia has like a very uh, huge um, kind of card to present. So if there is something happen we can not give you gas or something like this or high price for the gas so it's every time like a very tricky point and um, of course um, there is another thing uh, that NATO or European Union uh, as for NATO uh, for Russian Federation uh, it's uh, this is um, kind of a question of national security uh, concerning to NATO, NATO. Uh, so every time when we had in 2008 after Orange Revolution, which took part in uh, in Ukraine, and uh, there was a dispute: should Ukraine be, become a part of NATO or not? And for Russia, it was kind of a threat because uh, to have like NATO forces in the neighbor, neighbor, neighboring country uh, was unacceptable for Russian government, and they were really opposing it. And of course, uh, the question of integration of to European Union, which we have now, um, this is uh, also uh, it's a very disputable questions, and also within in Ukraine. So as we know, we have like East Ukraine, which is more mostly Russian speaking, and West Ukraine, which is mostly Ukrainian speaking, but still. Um, a lot of people are willing to have some kind of operation with EU and Russia. In its terms, uh, sometimes uh, plays like a role of facilitator of some disputes or opposing the uh, possibility of neighboring countries to have a pro-Western view. Because every time uh, for Russia, something uh, like the connections with uh, other communities except of Russian community can be um, seen as some kind of anti-Russian and uh, some kind of very bad for its policy. So then Russia and Russian government, I mean, uh, every time likes to um, have some kind of information wars and it's very popular in media. So for example, uh, when it was a gas dispute with, uh, with Ukraine a couple of years ago, there was a very popular statement in Russian media saying that portraying Ukraine as aggressive and greedy state that wanted to ally with Russian enemies and exploit cheap Russian gas. And um, also now uh, some kind of cooperation with European Union is also uh, portrayed like a threat and it's in official Russian medias. Um, and the problematic thing that uh, Russian media is mostly controlled by the states so unfortunately people can't see the alternative point of view but okay uh, but still there is one um, alternative uh, website uh, uh, channel in russia it's called Dodge, Dodge, uh, which uh, translated like rain but still it is not fully covered in russia and as you know russia is so huge so probably in moscow people are more informed but in the other part of russia uh, they are not and uh, yes, just to, I will not continue like with uh, all the difficulties with situation. Uh, just the thing is that when Putin officially say that um, we have come uh, uh, portraying uh, like saying to Ukrainian uh, like uh, saying about Ukraine, we have common traditions, common mentality, and common history, common cultural cultures. We are own people. Uh, going back to the history of Russian Empire and saying that we are one nation as, as such. 
at the same time, people in Ukraine uh, saying on this big board, this is Putin, если любишь, отпусти. Putin, if you love us, let us go. This, this main, it's, uh, the photo is taken uh, during the protests which are held now in Ukraine. So the main point is actually that Russian authority is kind of one-sided and that's why it's not about the different histories of Russians or Ukrainians. It's not about people itself or civil societies. Uh, it's about the uh, regime uh, that actually can be very uh, forceful and interrogating in, this fo in its foreign uh, policy approach. Yeah, thank you. And now we are going to talk a little bit about Russian culture. To outline uh, the major export and import products, we have this um, data. Like uh, the main export partners, according to the 2012, are Netherlands, China, Italy, Germany. They export um, autos, um, uh, some products, pharmaceuticals. Um, and the main import partners are China, Germany, and Ukraine. And now we would like to go um, to go on with culture. And um, I would like to give a word to Masha. Cool. Sorry. Um, so Russian culture is quite rich. Rich. Um, and um, I'm just gonna, we're just going to quickly show you uh, some famous Russian um, writers and philosophers. Uh, as you know, like the most famous Russian works, I don't know, throw some names at me. Russian books. One piece. Good. Anything else? Uh, Master and Margarita, Crime and Punishment, uh, Evgeny Onegin, Dead Souls, Father and Sons. Uh, so we have Pushkin. Gogol, Lermontov, um, Bulgakov, and so on. Uh, then we have uh, interesting, uh, we have a great Russian, um, well, who do we have, who do we have next? Uh, famous Russian philosophers and scientists. Uh, do you want to tell uh, them? For example, Bakunin. Kropotkin. Uh, Bakunin and Kropotkin, they were like a famous. Uh, anarchist philosophers and the I idea I was... Ah, oh, okay. Anyway, uh, yes, and Solovyov and uh, Berdaev and... Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, How much do you guys want to go home? Like, we, we have yeah, half a presentation left. Okay, uh, so then, who else? Do we? Go on next. Yeah. Okay, Tchaikovsky. Do you, um, now we, you, pr you probably know the music. We're going to show you um, a cartoon, like a quick version of a Russian, a very short Russian cartoon, uh, because his music is really famous. of a Russian, famous Russian ballet um, afterwards, Bolshoi Teatro.
Okay. Thank you. Um, next. Oh, let's just go through them. Yeah, this is a Russian uh, famous composers. Uh, for example, Achmaninov, uh, oh no, oh no, no, Rimsky, Korsakov, Mussorgsky, they were part of uh, uh, the, the a group of composers which were very famous in the 19th century. And Glinka, Achmaninov, and Stravinsky, they're also very famous. Rachmaninov had a great influence on uh, music uh, as such in uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Um, we probably won't have time to talk about the scientists, but um, some of the things that Russian scientists created were periodic table, Mendeleev, yes. then um, electric lamps, inverters of radio, uh, laser, and then the greatest Russian successes in the field of space technology and space exploration. Nowadays, Russia is the largest satellite launcher and the only provider of transport for space tourism services. Uh, Russia is also famous for its icons. And um, most famous we are from our ballet. So uh, we have Swan Lake, we have Nutcracker, uh, Russian ballet, Bolshoi ballet. It's really beautiful. You guys should definitely come see it at least once. Um, then opera, uh, theatre. Uh, Russians still go to the theatre quite often to see as classical uh, as well as modern performances. Uh, then we talk about sport. Russia is very famous for um, ice hockey, for... <laughs> gymnastics, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> gymnastics and um, synchronized swimming, and um, then as well for figure skating. Uh, okay, now we're going to talk about. Uh, what am I talking about? <laughs> sorry, okay, guys, I'm just going to give you um, if you ever want to go, we're going to show you some photos of Russia of how beautiful it is in some places. And I just want to finish my part with um, telling you two interesting facts about Russia if you ever want to go. So, the Soviet Union has, ex uh, has ceased existing almost 20 years ago, and yet some leftovers of the time are still present. For example, cues are Russian reality. So, you do, would you want to send a postcard to your family from the post office or maybe buy a ticket on the sub for the subway? Well, be prepared to wait in the line of rushed and happy people who seem to want to push you all the time. Uh, don't get um, those people with, I just have a small question to ask, squeeze in front of you because otherwise standing um, in queues will be your full-time job. And second thing, don't go Dutch. Here's where Russians <laughs> differ strikingly from Western Europeans. They don't go Dutch. So if you ask a lady out, don't expect her to pay for herself uh, unless you, um, I mean, that rules out the possibility of seeing her again. So, yeah, that's can I, can again, from my friend. Yep. We have here slides of uh, several uh, different um, ethnic uh, groups in Russia. Actually, there are 150 other languages existing in Russia, and people are actually using it in the, uh, mostly in the houses. Um, but yeah, the official language is still Russian, and they know it, um, such as uh, Chukchi, Udmurti, Shorty. Uh, and so on. Um, do you want to know about religions a bit? Uh, decades of Soviet rule have left their mark. Up to half of Russians declare themselves atheist, uh, though figure value. And there are loads of um, there are 14 to 20 million Muslims. There's some Buddhists. Uh, so um, even though Russian Orthodox Church is very famous and uh, a lot of influential, 75% uh, yeah, of Russians are Russian Orthodox. So there's just um, photos of some Russian uh, churches. Yeah, uh, this is Vla Vla uh, Vladimir, just a famous town. Um, and then we just want to finish with um, pictures of Russia, of different parts of Russia. Uh, I'm from here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but it's I true. <laughs> are you are you really from there? This this our Kamchatka. Uh, this one. Okay, sorry then. The next one. No. We have volcanoes I'm not from here. I'm not from Beautiful here. Volcanoes. I'm sorry. So uh, the landscape is pretty varied. Um, Oh, we this this is the place where I from I come from. <laughs> this is Baikal. This is the famous uh, largest lake. It's not the largest; it's the deepest. The deepest. The, the deepest. deepest. Sorry. 
<laughs> this is also my photo. <laughs> and we have a desert. James, you probably didn't know that. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, really, where is it? <laughs> actually, actually, it's um, Astrakhan. Yeah, <laughs> this one's also by Kaum. I'm sorry. <laughs> I cannot help myself. <laughs> this one's too. It's, it's me. You. Oh, it's you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just to prove that I was there and that I'm <laughs> Then we just have uh, some Russian famous people, some famous Russian people. So it's just, um, we're not gonna go through. Sorry? Uh, yeah, we have, we brought some sweets. They are not originating directly from Russia, but I, I, I bought them. Okay. Yeah, but you can try. Yeah, but you can try. Yeah, we have some uh, a lot of uh, famous people like so um, this is Anna Ahmatova. Anna Ahmatova, yeah. Famous writer. Um, Khrushchev. Marshak. He wrote a lot of uh, children books and poems. Akujava. Guys, who is that? <laughs> who is that? Yes. Good. That's yes. correct. Uh, Vysotsky. Brodsky, famous writer. And this was uh, Victor Tsoy, uh, a musician. Oh. Guys. Yeah. This one, Gagarin, yeah. This is a very um, famous um, actor, Leonov, Abdulov. Um, yeah, tattoo, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are from Russia. <laughs> Sharapova. Lushenko, Yevtushenko. That we having problems with the law. I think that girl, like yeah. So there is a new law. Isinbaeva. The new law, Russian law. Uh, what is this? This is an actor also from Russia, uh, yeah. Grigory Siatvinda. <laughs> Yeah, these are, are just pictures of our famous um, dishes. Blini. Um, I don't pickles. know how to say. Marino pickles. Okay, that would be <laughs> large pickles. Tvorak. You don't want to know what half of those things Pirashki. are made of. <laughs> Pilmini. Um, mushrooms. Kampot. Yeah. Do you actually know what compote is? No. Yeah. Yes? Go on, Ariane. Ariane, explain. You drink it, you warm it up, and you drink it. And it's really sweet. Some kind of syrupy tea. Do, okay. you, know how, do you know how we cook it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a topic for the next presentation. Okay. Um, Mante or pose. Borsh. Um, Silotka. Herenia, varenia, jam. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank and you very much. <laughs>